Hi, Jeff. It's lovely to have you on this podcast today. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. We're going to discuss a topic that I know is very close to your heart and you're the expert. How is the vintage watch market doing? Tell us all. It's a very interesting time in our hobby with respect to vintage watches. We've come through a period in recent years, in particular 2020, 21, 22, where there was a shift from vintage watches into modern watches. In, let's say, 2017, 18, 19, there was an enormous focus on vintage watches. It really was sort of the highlight of attention in the watch collecting community, frankly, more so with respect to vintage Rolex than anything else. But come 2020, 2021, 2022, we saw a meaningful shift in attention to modern watches. And that really runs the gamut of brands and it extends beyond attention and focus on Rolex, on Audemars Piquet, on Patek Philippe. There was a meaningful portion of attention placed on independent watchmaking as well. So we really saw the birth of the collecting of independent watches in recent years. But we're coming through a period where there was so much attention attention on modern watches, and we're sort of seeing a little bit of a resurgence now, in particular in the last even six months on vintage watch collecting again. Now, why do I say that? I think a lot of what we saw in 2021 and 2022 in particular was this meaningful growth in the price of watches. And that was largely centered on modern watches. And in particular, with respect to a handful of models, we saw a lot of attention on independent watches. We saw a lot of attention on Royal Oaks, on certain steel sports models like Daytonas. And in fact, we saw the birth of a term called hyped watches, that social media had a significant impact on drawing collectors' attention to a handful of modern watch references. And there was very significant focus placed on that. It became almost like trendy. And those watches are terrific, but they lend themselves a little bit less to scholarship. What do I mean? The collecting of vintage watches requires a little bit more study, a little bit more of a deeper dive than the average simple modern watch that you can go to a store and buy and it comes with box and papers. Everything is perfect and new. With vintage watches, it requires a deeper dive. It requires a collector to take the time to study them, to learn about the nuances, the different iterations of dials and bezels and bracelets and fonts and loom. So I think we saw a little bit less of that during the COVID era, if you will. It was a much faster pace of collectors focusing on modern watches. It's no secret that last year in particular, we saw a somewhat meaningful downtrend in the price of watches, not dissimilar to other asset classes. We've seen this across multiple categories. And a lot of the froth and that run-up that wasn't necessarily sustainable in watches has started less speculative buying. So what happened, I think what we saw a lot of in recent years was people buying largely for investment purposes, speculative purposes. And the majority of that purchasing was in modern watches. And to some degree, the real honest collector who really loves watches, who's passionate about them, who studies them and lives them and breathes them and takes that deep dive that's often associated with vintage watch collecting, they sort of felt priced out a little bit. We started to hear collectors begin to say, this isn't fun anymore. I'm priced out. I'm glad I have what I have because I couldn't afford to do it anymore. So with that, you saw this huge run up in the price of modern watches because a lot of it was driven by speculative buying. As those prices peeled back and as we saw that downtrend 
in the past year. And again, that's not unique to watches. That's not dissimilar from other categories like cars, for example. We've seen a heightened attention from real collectors who really love watches or really passionate about them and who are returning to the market. So I like to say that the fun is back. The fun has returned. It wasn't necessarily sustainable. And while it's great to see more and more collectors enter the fold, of course, we all welcome that and that's continuing. It's healthier if that's in large part driven by real collectors that really love watches, that are passionate about them. It's more sustainable if people discover the beauty of watches in that context and aren't just driven by investment. So coming full circle to your question, you asked me about the vintage watch market. In short, what we've seen is somewhat of a downtrend in the past year. As there is less speculative buying and more buying and purchasing by collectors who love watches because vintage watch collecting isn't for the person who just wants to buy a watch quickly, put it in their closet and hope that they make money. The vintage watch collecting is grounded in studying details like art history. Who was the maker? Why was it made this way? What iteration is this? All of that is an incredibly exciting journey that watch collectors of vintage watches love to take. But it's complex. It takes time. You can spend years and years learning, not dissimilar from collecting art because it's a piece of art. It's just smaller and portable and on your wrist. You know, a number of years ago, I think it was maybe seven or eight years ago, I gave an interview and I discussed how collectors were struggling between finding an equilibrium between passion and investment. For years, if you even said the word investment in connection with watches, you got a slap on the wrist and people just said, oh, just buy what you love. You can't think about money. You could just buy what you love. And it was almost taboo to talk about watches as an investment. The struggle came as watches started to increase in price, 2015, 16, 17, 18. As watches escalated in price, it became very fair for a collector to start to think, hey, is this a wise place to put money? I love the watch, but is this liquid? Is there a market for it? If I need to get out of it, or I need to buy something else, can I sell it? Will I make money? Will I lose money? All of those questions became more and more fair. It was no longer taboo. And that's what I mean by this struggle between passion and investment. What we saw in the last few years was watches got so valuable and there was so much speculative buying that that equation tipped. And we went from passion being the majority to investment taking up perhaps an unhealthy portion of that equation. And the real collector who loves watches wasn't having fun. He was priced out by people buying watches just for money. And now we're seeing that the fun is back and people are more willing to take a deeper dive. They're more willing to study watches. They're less inclined to just go to a store, buy a watch and go home with it. As a consequence, we're seeing a greater and renewed interest in vintage watches once again. It's really a wonderful thing. You know, the other thing that bears noting is the impact impact of social media. For years and years, there was no social media. Instagram, for example, which plays such a material role in the way watches are viewed, is still a relatively new endeavor. I'm a watch collector for 30 years. For most of that time, there was no Instagram, and we lived on internet forums, on watch collecting forums, and those served as a wonderful ground for learning. There was very meaningful discourse. You got to learn who were the real experts, and you learned from them, and there was back and forth about watch details, what was right, what was wrong, what bezel should go with what watch, what loom, the years of watches, and we learned there was very education. When Instagram became such a material part of watch collecting, 
content became faster. We all know that we're in a much faster world now and people like fast content. And now if you log on to Instagram, you can find on any given moment thousands and thousands of watch pictures. That is good and exciting. And it's been very interesting to see the types of customers that are entering this great hobby of ours. But with that comes a little bit less ability for discourse and for education you're really seeing a picture more than anything else. There aren't pages and pages of discourse on Instagram. It's very fast and quick content. It's even difficult on Instagram to determine who are the experts that really know the most that we should be trusting. Who are the scholars? I've had some concern that on one hand, Instagram and social media has been great for watches. It's broadened our audience. It's captured the attention of millions, literally millions of people across the globe in connection with our hobby. At the same time, though, there's been a lot less discourse, a lot less education than that which we had from the internet forums, which are beginning to disappear. And therefore, it becomes a little bit harder to collect vintage watches because you really need that education. You need those experts helping to guide you. You can't just go to a store and say, I'll take it. Um, so that's a bit of a challenge. It's a bit of a challenge that as we want to collect vintage watches more and more, and as these passionate collectors come into the fold, where are they to learn? How do we create the next set of experts in vintage watch collecting? Where is the best place for people to learn and study and meet people? Undoubtedly for me and for so many people, the great joy in watch collecting more than anything else is the people. Somebody once said to me that you buy the stories, you buy the people, you buy the narrative. The watch is just a bonus. The great joy in collecting is the people. I like to say that watches don't just tell time, they connect people. And I think that the true watch collector, the person that really is passionate about watches, recognizes that the greatest joy comes from the people that we meet and the stories that they bring about their treasure hunts. We always talk about the thrill of the hunt. Really, that's in large part the most fun, how we find these watches. So last year, I hosted an event for the second time called Roly Fest, and I had 175 people from 17 countries all descend upon New York in a non-commercial way. I really partnered with Sotheby's to some degree, and they were enormously supportive because Sotheby's recognizes, as all collectors, as all great collectors do, that the real joy is in sharing. I use an analogy often, and this goes right to the heart of a discussion around collectors. It's listening to music. You can go home and listen to music on a pair of headphones in the comfort of your room, and it can be a very relaxing, enjoyable experience. However, if you go to a concert and you listen to live music and you watch a band or a group on a stage in the company of hundreds of other concert goers in a room, there's nothing that can compete with that energy. That is a completely different experience. And that best describes, in my view, that is best analogous to the joy in watch collecting. And it's why we're seeing more and more events. It's why I think Roly Fest was such a fun exercise, and I'll use the word successful. People loved being together. Tell us a bit more about the collectors and how the demographics have changed as well. What you see at Sotheby's, who is collecting watches, especially after COVID and you know the new generation that came onto the market because they were using the internet in 2020, 2022. So who are these collectors that you're meeting? Well, there's no question about it that as watch collecting and as the auction world, both at Sotheby's and beyond, has grown more and more digital, we're seeing such a meaningful portion of our buyers acquiring watches online as opposed to being in the room. With that has come a younger demographic. There's no question that the largest, the largest majority of watch collectors that come through our doors are in their 30s and 40s. That's no coincidence, and it's much more digital than it's ever been before. So I think to answer your question, we can speak about two things, age group and geographic group. Age group it's definitely become younger. That's not to say there aren't many people in their 50s, 60s and beyond collecting watches. 
No doubt there are. But without question, the facts don't lie. We're seeing a younger demographic. We're seeing lots and lots of people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s discovering the joy of watches far more than ever before. I don't think it's a coincidence that, again, that coincides in large part with the way watches are presented at auction houses, for example, and with the advent of social media. And the fact lends itself very well to a younger audience and a younger demographic. At the same token, it certainly bears noting geography. It is astonishing to see how global the watch collecting community has grown. If we look at Sotheby's last live auction in the first week in December, so this is really last month, we had 1,300 bidders from just over 60 countries. 1,300 bidders from over 60 countries. It's extraordinary. This is no longer a small hobby that appeals to a small demographic in the United States. We have people from all over the world bidding at our auctions and all over the world calling in, sharing their watches, consigning watches, coming to our events, looking at our content. It is absolutely extraordinary. So not only has the audience become younger, it has most definitely become broader. For sure, there are certain brands that dominate more than others. There's no question about it. Rolex, you know, is a king, for example. But nevertheless, the footprint that we're seeing at Sotheby's is enormously exciting because it's so large. When we go live with an auction, we are talking to the whole world. And it's incredibly exciting. It's really changed the playing field. And what have been the most exciting watches you've seen coming up at auction at Sotheby's recently? That's a great question. When people ask that question, very often the proclivity is to run to talk about the most expensive watches. And no, no, the most is, exciting for you as a connoisseur. Right. That's exactly my point. I would submit that the most exciting watches as a connoisseur to your question are not necessarily the ones that command the biggest price. For a lot of collectors, the most exciting watches are the ones that carry the biggest stories. We talk about provenance so often. It is the most exciting watches for me are the ones in which you can trace ownership to. We talk about original owner watches. When we know who the first owner was, even if that person isn't famous, it's very exciting. It's thrilling to hear about a grandfather who passes a watch down to his son, who passes it down to his son, and to hear about lineage like that. Sometimes that's connected to famous people. So for example, last year, Sotheby's had the great pleasure of selling a very famous football coach's watch. There was a very famous football coach named Tom Landry. He coached the Dallas Cowboys for over two decades, I think 25 years. Multiple championships, multiple Super Bowl victories. He's one of the most famous coaches in the history of American football. The gold Rolex that he wore on his wrist through multiple championships and through Super Bowls was passed on to his son. And his son entrusted Sotheby's with presenting that to the world. And we sold the watch. The watch sold for about $90,000. It's interesting because the watch without the provenance would have probably been worth somewhere between ten and $15,000. But because it had this incredible story attached to it, and because it walked the sidelines of Super Bowls, it's apropos to talk about that because the, the next Super Bowl is in 10 days, um, that watch commanded a meaningful premium over... The same watch without the provenance. We're talking six or seven X. So for me, that was incredibly exciting. I grew up watching Tom Landry. So to be able to present the watch that he wore during Super Bowl victories was very exciting. So that's one that really stands out. We sold an old Cartier that Charlie Chaplin gave to his wife, Una. It didn't set the world on fire as far as price is concerned. It was about a $35,000 price. It was nonetheless very exciting. It felt like we were bringing history to the watch collecting community. Now, with that said, I'd be lying if I said it isn't still very exciting. And Sotheby's has the great privilege of selling a lot of watches that sell for eight figures or, or seven figures. 
So last year, for example, or last month, we sold two watches. We sold a very special Rolex Daytona called a Paul Newman. And specifically, it's called a John Player Special because of the colors. It's a black and gold watch that modeled after or very similar to the John Player Special cigarettes of yesteryear. And here's an instance where the original owner's family has been holding this watch for 50 years or so. And they came to us and they said, we have this very special watch. What's it worth? We'd like to consider selling it. And we had the great privilege of presenting this family heirloom. It really was nothing more than that. The owner's name, the owner itself isn't a famous family, but it was embraced as so special because nobody had ever seen it before. You know, the other phrase that we talk about in watch collecting is fresh to market. That's a very meaningful part of watch collecting. Watch collectors love watches that are rare. We love them with history and provenance, and we love them when they're fresh to market, when they haven't been seen before. It really is like uncovering a treasure chest. So that was a beautiful, exciting watch that sold for just over one and a half million dollars. Very exciting for a watch that probably cost a couple of hundred dollars, you know, in the 60s and 70s. So that was certainly exciting for me. A very similar story is we sold a very rare vintage Patek Philippe called a 1518. And again, a very similar story. Original owner's family writes into Sotheby's. They know we have a tremendous experience in presenting these kinds of trophy watches. And it was a joy discovering it and seeing how this watch was preserved and learning about its life and where it had traveled and the risks that it had been on. It too was fresh to market, never been seen before, and similarly sold for an equally eye-popping one and a half million dollars. So, you know, those are four watches off the top of my head that we've sold in the last 60 days that I'm incredibly excited about. Our next big live global sale is June 5th in America. I'm speaking to America. It bears noting Sotheby's has a significant presence and a big watch office in Hong Kong and a big watch office in Geneva, among other places. And those geographies have their own big sales. But I'm speaking to America. And the next big one in America is June 5th. And I can tell you already, we have some very exciting watches previously owned by some famous people with some great stories. And again, at the end of the day, the most interesting part about watches are the stories that they tell and the narratives and the histories. And I'm, we're very excited about what's to come in the coming months. And we often talk about the grinding life of being in the auction world. There's enormous amounts of travel. I'm gone. Four out of the last five weekends, I've been on the road. But it really is true when you do what you love. And I get to meet and associate with collectors from all over the globe and go to all these events. It doesn't feel like work. So I sort of pinch myself very regularly that I work for a place that is so supportive, it really doesn't feel like work. Despite the long hours and all the travel and the grind, which it is to some degree, I don't really go home feeling exhausted or shot like some people would. And I'm very fortunate to be able to say that I really do what I love. And it just makes the journey a lot more palatable and the long hours very easy to undertake. That's great to hear. I have one last question for you, Jeff. You gave us such a fantastic overview of the market, the collectors, what's happening at Sotheby's, what's going to happen at Sotheby's. What is the watch that is missing in your collection, the holy grail of your collection? Great question. Let me tell you a little story, if I might, for a minute. Somebody once coined the phrase, the collecting arc. And what does that mean? And that is a journey that so many collectors find themselves having been a part of. Nobody starts their collecting journey with a million dollar vintage watch. People start by buying a simple entry level watch. It's more likely to be new. And then they eventually say, you know, I want to get a different iteration, a rarer version. And then maybe they discover a vintage one and then they want an even better one and then they want a rarer one. And they go up the chain and climb the arc. After a period of time, oftentimes people start to say, oh, that's a very expensive watch that I've acquired. I've really climbed the mountain. I'm at the top of the summit. And I kind of miss having that 
the other watch that I had months ago that was simple, that was a little less complicated and maybe less expensive. I think I'm going to sell my most expensive watch and rediscover some of the things that I collected when I started. And they start going down the mountain again. And you sometimes find yourself collecting watches and rediscovering the joy of those entry-level watches. So the answer to your question, I could answer it in a few ways. I could say, sure, there are some very rare Daytonas that I would love to own. You know, again, my Instagram handle is Manhattan Roly, and Roly comes from Rolex, and that's the brand that I love most. But it bears noting I, I'm a big Langa collector, a big Panerai collector. I collect Hoyer and a lot of brands. But I feel like to some degree I've conquered and discovered so many different um, references from each of those brands. I hate to say it, I'm 54 years old, so I've been collecting for 30 years, so I've had quite a bit of time to do it. And I'm starting to rediscover some of the more simple watches that I collected years ago, watches that I let go of because they were more entry level. So yes, there are some very fancy exotic dial Paul Newman Daytonas that I would love to acquire someday that are always on my radar screen. But you know, there are some much simpler watches that I'm discovering now as part of my journey. And I think that's been a great joy going through that collecting arc. And it's something people don't necessarily think about all the time time, but it's really true. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. I love it. I love the collecting arc. And I think a lot of people will relate to that as well. Jeff, it's been such a pleasure having you on this podcast. A Real Corner, sir, is the first time we dedicate a whole episode to timepieces, to watches. So it's very special. And I'm so glad we did it with your uh, participation. So thank you very much, Jeff. Well, I can't thank you enough for having me. I've really enjoyed it. And I appreciate your thinking of me and Sotheby's. Thanks so much.